Police arrive at a scene of horror in East London. A man has been murdered inside his own flat. Limbs are severed and his head almost decapitated. The killer is standing in front of them. He's fried the victim's brain and eaten it. He killed an innocent young woman just 11 years before. His name is Peter Bryan. Why was this terrifying man allowed back onto the streets to commit one of Britain's most gruesome and shocking murders? One in five murders in the UK is now committed by an ex-prisoner. From serial rapists, he harbored dark thoughts about carrying out sexual offenses. To convicted killers. They'd met in prison. They were out on the streets together. Free to walk amongst us. They knew he could have killed again. Free to murder innocent people. She stabbed him many times, and then she hid him in a wheelie bin. I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm examining how such tragedies happen. Who's to blame? Is it the justice system? Or are these killers just pure evil? She gained pleasure from hurting people. And ultimately, could an innocent life have been saved? This is Release to Kill. Peter Bryan was born in East London in 1969 the youngest of seven children in a poor West Indian family. At school, he's a bully. He steals from other children. He struggles academically, and by the time he's 12, he's part of a violent street gang. At this early age, Brian is already smoking cannabis. We do know that at that age, our brains are still developing, so it makes sense that using any kind of um, intoxicating substance would impact on the brain development. Where people have predispositions towards mental illness, cannabis can act almost as a trigger to flip that switch. At 15, he drops out of school with no qualifications. Dropping out of school can have an, an incredibly big impact. You're sort of branded as an outcast. You're essentially being told, we don't want you, and that can be incredibly damaging. Before long, Brian has his first run-in with the law. Peter Brian first came to notice of police when he was 18. Uh, there was a call to some flats in East London where he had a scuffle with a, a resident, and the other man, the victim, had alleged that Peter Bryan tried to throw him from the eighth floor to the ground. Fighting ensued, police attended, but there was no further action taken. Peter Bryan moves from job to job, but then lands a good position. He uh, found a job in the King's Road in Chelsea as a sales uh, assistant in a clothes shop, which seemed to be a good, solid job for, for a man of his limited uh, education soon and he realized how easy it was to steal from his employer. The employer found out and quite naturally sacked him. On the morning of March 18th, 1993, he roused with rival gang members and used a hammer to smash up their car. He then visits a friend where he smokes cannabis and drinks wine. At 6.30 that evening and still carrying the hammer, he heads to the clothes shop where he used to work. Brian had in his mind that he was owed over just over £100 uh, by the owner. Peter Brian went back to the shop and confronted the daughter of the, of the shop owner. He demands money from the 20-year-old Nisha Sheff, but she refuses. He completely lost his temper and just started attacking her. Eventually, he battered her to death with a claw hammer, a, a hideous weapon. It left this poor girl with no chance of survival. Realising what he'd done, he made an attempt to take his own life. About an hour and a half after the attack, he's seen hanging by his fingertips from a tower block walkway about 30 to 40 feet from the ground. He drops, severely fracturing both ankles. 
Whilst recovering in hospital from his attempted suicide, Peter Bryan is arrested on suspicion of murder. He's remanded to Brixton prison until his trial date. While in Brixton, Bryan attacks two fellow inmates. Psychiatrists diagnose him with paranoid psychosis, and because he's potentially dangerous to himself and others, he's moved to Rampton Psychiatric Hospital. Psychotic episodes where somebody is seeing or hearing some stimuli that is not reflective of reality. Some people, they could have a single psychotic episode in their lifetime, and for others, it's almost a daily occurrence and is incredibly pervasive throughout their lives and, and really difficult to manage. Rampton is in Nottinghamshire and is one of only three high-security psychiatric hospitals in England. High-security psychiatric units would typically feature those who would be considered the most dangerous to the outside world. On February 25th, 1994, Peter Bryan appears in court, charged with the murder of Nisha Sheth. Peter Bryan was clearly responsible for the killing and uh, he pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility on the basis of his mental illness that uh, psychiatrists uh, believed he'd been suffering from at the time of the attack. Proof of diminished responsibility requires the offender to show that he or she was suffering from a disease of mind at the time of the killing, whereby, in effect, that person's thought processes were overcome by that disease of mind. Um, so it's a high threshold. But if established, then it's deemed that the offender's responsibility is diminished from murder to manslaughter. A plea of diminished responsibility allows a judge to sentence an individual to secure psychiatric care rather than a term in prison. When he appeared in court, Peter Bryan was sentenced under the Mental Health Act to be detained indefinitely. In other words, without limit of time, and uh, he would only be eligible for release if doctors believed he was no longer a threat to the public. On December 17th, 1993, Peter Bryan is returned to Rampton Secure Hospital. There, he will receive long-term psychiatric care. Brian doesn't have the easiest of childhoods, but to go from stealing to murder is a pretty steep trajectory. Were there any early predictors for serious violence? Retired prison governor Vanessa Frake and Professor Taj Nathan, a forensic psychiatrist, join me in the Crime Hub to discuss the case. I can't understand what provoked him to actually commit his first murder. You know, he was sacked from his job, mm. so he retaliates against the daughter of the owner of the shop. Uh, yeah, so, so I think that would have played a part, but I think uh, what is likely to, to have played mu a much bigger part was the fact that he was likely to, uh, to be developing mental health problems uh, in the period immediately before uh, th this attack. So it was reported by the victim's mother that his behaviour was very changeable, his mood was up and down, he was growing his beard, shaving his beard, shaving his hair, uh, behaving in a very unusual way, which with hindsight suggests that for at least two, three, if not four months, he was developing mental health problems. So there's some evidence that in his adolescence mm. he was using, um, heavily using, uh, cannabis. Yes. How would this have impacted his antisocial criminal behaviour and indeed his future mental health illness? But there's clear evidence that if an individual is using cannabis quite heavily during the adolescent period that that may increase the risk of psychosis later on. So after this offence, uh, Brian goes off and tries to commit suicide. Can we inevitably take it that when he jumped from around 30 feet from that walkway that he actually intended to kill himself? I'm, I'm not sure we can. I mean, it, it may have been a suicide attempt uh, after the incident. It may be that if he, if he were in the psychotic state that I believe he was at the time, that it could have been a bizarre motivation. To what extent would that confirm his mental health issues? So I can't be absolutely sure what was going on, but I think it, it's likely that um, it was a manifestation of, of some sort of disorder in his mind that he was experiencing. And halfway down, uh, he, he, he grabs hold 
of a railing and then eventually drops and breaks his legs. Uh, I mean, this desperate suicide attempt. I mean, you, obviously you're dealing with suicide attempts and suicides you know, pretty regularly in, in prison. This would seem to be a very genuine uh, effort. I think we can safely say that um, anybody who didn't want to commit suicide wouldn't wouldn't even it wouldn't even cross their mind to throw themselves off a off a walkway i mean my, my take on that is that this was um d d uh, this was during a state of of uh, of psychosis what diagnosis was proffered to which resulted in his conviction for diminished responsibility uh, the psychiatric assessment um, agreed that he was suffering from a psychotic mental illness and the diagnosis was schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is a mental illness, a serious mental illness, uh, in which the patients um, may hear voices or they may experience delusions, so they have false beliefs. What do you think the general public feel about um, defences like this, diminished responsibility? In general, the general public would think that it was a cop-out, and I think possibly for the victim's family, would be raging about it. I know, you know, if it was if it was my daughter um, that was treated like that um, in that brutal way, I would feel very, very um, like justice hadn't been served. A woman losing her life needlessly, senselessly, terrible act of violence, uh, a sick man suffering from delusions, oh. psychosis, commits it. This is a double tra tragedy. I would agree, it's, it, it's a double tragedy. So uh, there's a loss of life. And there's also a case of a man who's developed a very serious psychotic illness that has led him to behave in this way. For the moment, Brian is not a threat. But in just 11 years, he'll kill again in an unbelievably violent fashion. Peter Brian has brutally murdered 20-year-old Nisha Sheth with a claw hammer. The court takes into account his mental health diagnosis and he's sentenced to an indefinite period of detention in Rampton High Security Psychiatric Hospital. When Brian was admitted to Rampton, it would be very likely that he would have undergone a full um, risk of violence assessment. You are just asked to consider historical items, um, behaviour in the last six months and future risk items. So that would be the assessment that a psychologist or psychiatrist would complete. For the first few months, Brian's behaviour is threatening and abusive. But he then settles into life at Rampton. There would be some TV watching, there would be very prescribed times for meals, there would likely be some form of therapeutic input. So the day-to-day -day isn't as extraordinary as perhaps you would assume. Over the next few years, Brian's antipsychotic medication is gradually withdrawn as he's displaying no symptoms of mental illness. He was settled, he was lucid, he could talk, uh, in a normal way, cognizant of everything, so he wasn't displaying as much mental illness. Occasionally, however, Brian's mental health deteriorates and he makes some shocking admissions. He admitted that he got a sexual frisson, a sexual kick from killing and the rituals involved. Brian is put back on medication, which stabilizes him, and he does everything possible to persuade staff that he no longer requires detention in a high secure hospital. A person like Peter Brian can mask their symptoms. They're particularly clever at appearing a perfect patient, a very normal person. I meet people who have killed people in awful ways, and it's extraordinary. They can appear utterly charming utterly normal and, and very logical about what they're doing. It's only later in a 2009 NHS report that failures come to life. The report states the two professionals were a psychiatrist who had never before had responsibility for a patient who had killed someone and a very inexperienced social worker who had no training in mental health. I think the mismanagement started really way back in Rampton, uh, where the social worker, uh, he wrote three times to the Home Secretary pleading that Peter Brown should be released and that he was fit and that he could be living safely in the community. Five years after his admission, a psychiatric report states that 
Mr. Brown does not present a grave and immediate danger to the safety of other persons. Is this the reality or is he just pretending? Despite concerning psychiatric reports about the way Brian remembers the killing of Nisha, he still presents himself as someone who's making real progress. So Brian has moved to Rampton. Although he settles down quite well, he does appear to be occasionally expressing some very odd thoughts. So I think he, he did speak to the nurses and, and um, echoed how he, he got a thrill from the first murder, which obviously, you know, is our first red flag, that if that murder gave him a thrill, you know, is, that, is there a possibility that he could go on to kill again? It's my understanding that uh, he disclosed, uh, this was once he was in hospital, he disclosed that he heard her saying, attack, attack me uh, or rape me. Um, and I believe that that is likely to be a consequence of the psychotic illness that he was experiencing at the time. So he may have heard or had feelings that she wanted to be attacked or, or killed. He also uh, challenged the staff with a threat to kill them if they didn't allow him to do what he wanted to do, which again, hugely problematic yeah. and concerning. Yes. He made that comment on at least one occasion, if, if you push me, uh, I, will, I will maim or I will kill a member of staff. And those sorts of comments in, in other circumstances may be seen as not a, an indicator of what the person's actually going to do. But in this case, where he has committed a, a, an act of very serious violence, it should be taken very seriously. What role is medication playing in his life? Um, so it, it's key to, key to the management. If he was experiencing voices, experiencing delusions, uh, then the antipsychotic anti medication would treat those symptoms. And they would be expected to take it. The issue, of course, is, is can you rely on people to take that medication? This sort of medication comes with serious side effects, uh, and those side effects can be unpleasant, so that may be one reason. It may be that the, the patient doesn't have insight, so they feel, well, I don't need to take medication because I'm not mentally ill. And I think the picture in this case suggests that as time went on, he didn't believe that he was mentally ill. After eight years in Rampton High Security Psychiatric Hospital, Peter Bryan's support team believe he's ready to be discharged. In 2002, a mental health tribunal agrees to transfer Bryan to a facility with a lower security rating, Riverside Hostel. Peter Bryan is now living in a hostel for men with mental health support needs in North East London and is able to come and go as he pleases. Hostels that individuals are released to still maintain restrictions. However, they're, they're often quite confusing for offenders because you're being placed into what feels like the community. Um, you're not under lock and key, so you're responsible for your own behaviour, but you are also simultaneously being given rules. Brian's life at Riverside progresses smoothly, although there are issues with him smoking cannabis, and he also tests positive for amphetamines. Then, two years later, in 2004, he allegedly assaults a 17-year-old girl at a block of flats near his hostel. When questioned by a forensic mental health nurse and social worker about the alleged attack, Brian denied all wrongdoing. He said he had attended the girl's flat, but that they had stolen his mobile phone and refused to give it back. So he just left. Now, all of those things should have sent alarm bells ringing. I mean, really, red flags flying. No further action is taken by the police, but the family of the alleged victim make death threats towards Brian. For his safety, he's moved nine miles away to Newham Hospital in East London. There, he's placed on an open ward, meaning he can come and go as he likes. The manager of the ward believes Brian should be on a locked ward. Before long, his judgment would prove tragically right. It appears that 
uh, after his release into the community that he started developing some of his old habits. The particular concern was his use of cannabis. It was recognised early on that cannabis may have been a contributor to his mental health problems in the first instance. And he was displaying problematic behaviour. He was falling out with people, he was pushing the boundaries. Um, and those are of concern and uh, may indicate that the risk is escalating. And there was one particularly serious incident which didn't perhaps provoke as much attention as it should have done. Uh, yeah, so, so it was alleged that he had uh, sexually assaulted a 17-year-old girl in her property, um, and she subsequently reported that to the police. Th that is an incident uh, that should have raised some concern. There should have been an emergency meeting about that incident. That would be a reason to say he should be returned to hospital and in all likelihood returned to a forensic hospital so that, so that there's then an opportunity to assess, is this to do with his mental health, is there a decline in his mental health and is the risk escalating? Let's not forget the police though, Donal. Police would certainly have done background checks once the uh, offence was reported. So why didn't they do anything? They could have taken him into custody, put him in police cells, got somebody to um, assess him. This is a critical I mean, my annoyance in this, this is a critical juncture across where, where someone's life could have been saved, literally with the stroke of a pen. The problem can arise where um, a, an individual has both mental health problems and a propensity to engage in antisocial behaviour, and the system as it is doesn't necessarily allow for joint management um, of those sorts of cases. Peter Bryan has killed once caving a young woman's head in with a claw hammer. Over the last 11 years, he's progressed from a high-security psychiatric hospital to medium-secure facilities. He's now on an open ward at Newham Hospital in East London. On the morning of February 17th, 2004, Peter Bryan's support team meets to assess him for release. All the experts met. So consultant, psychiatrist, psychologist, nursing team, um, all of them, and decided he was fine and they could proceed with that basis of putting him back into the community and they were just looking for accommodation for him. Until accommodation is found, Brian is allowed to come and go from the ward as he pleases. Within hours, this decision will have horrific consequences. That very morning, he left, went to a hardware store, uh, purchased a claw hammer and a screwdriver. Peter Bryan makes his way to the home of a friend he's made, Brian Cherry. Now, Cherry was 43. He was a harmless enough man and he lived in a, in a ground floor flat in Walthamstow. Brian is let in, but then launches a shockingly violent attack. Using a claw hammer, the same weapon he used to kill Nisha Sheth, he inflicts over 24 injuries to the victim's head alone. Soon after the attack, a friend of Cherry's lets herself into the flat, completely unaware of the horror she's about to witness. The female friend had gone round to Brian Cherry's flat. She had a key, she let herself in. And when she went in, she said, where's Brian? And piece of Brian said, he's dead. I kind of moved away and she went into the living room where she could see his arms had been severed from his body and his head had been severely um, bashed in. But she calmly said, I just need to uh, do something. And she backed out of the flat whilst Peter Bryan was standing there in the kitchen doorway. And she called police. Within minutes, officers are on the scene. Uh, Brian presented no uh, struggle, no, uh, no attempt to uh, uh, confront them at all. Uh, and they were greeted with a scene of absolute horror. There was Brian Cherry, this harmless man in his 40s, lying on the floor, both arms severed, one leg severed, and his hat, his head almost decapitated. The pathologist 
had said that knives and standing knife were used to cut around the flesh at the joint of the shoulder. But then the bones had either been broken or pulled from their sockets. Usually, when you get dismemberment, it, it's difficult to do with a knife. It's done with a saw. But Peter Bryan must have jumped on Brian Cherry's arms and legs in order to weaken them and sever them from his body. In the kitchen, on the uh, cooker, there was a frying pan. With it, clearly, human remains, mostly brains, with hair and a tub of butter. And alongside that was a plate, a knife and fork, and what was left of what Brian had done, and that is eat his victim. The crime scene was so horrific that police officers who attended suffered long-term trauma. And he said to them, Brian's dead. I've just eaten part of his brains. It was nice. Peter Bryan was arrested for the murder of Brian Cherry. Brian has killed again. How was he let loose in the community without any supervision? And how did he escalate from killing someone with a hammer to cannibalism? What stands out to you of significance on the day that uh, he exploded into violence again? It might have been suggested that he had a, a plan or an agenda. Well, I'd want to know whether he was just going for a wander around with his friends. But after he left the hostel, he goes on and he starts to retrace, I suppose, the actions of his uh, first murder years earlier. He visits a hardware store, he, he buys uh, tools which turn out to be weapons uh, in, in the offence that he goes on to commit. And one of them is a claw ha hammer. Yes. And, of course, he used the claw, claw hammer in the first murder of Nisha in 1994. Yes. Um, how significant is it that, actually, he re practically retraces the steps, hardware store, claw hammer? There is something... Uh, uh, that is part of his mental health problem or part of his psyche uh, that means that this is important, the way he carries out the offence and the actions that he takes, that there is now a pattern. Why do uh, murderers uh, kind of replicate uh, their actions? In the cases that they do, then it represents the way their violent thoughts emerge in their mind. So they'll emerge in a particular way. So although you've got this chaotic a schizophrenic, psychotic mind, it still appears to be ordered enough to follow the same pattern, nearly weapon for weapon, despite 20 years of treatment. Well, that's right. So he, it, um, it's now clear that he will always remain liable to those experiences and that when he has those psychotic experiences that they will occur in a similar fashion. When we say psychotic, yes. what does it mean? So it, it's a term that is used to describe uh, a significant detachment with reality. A person hearing voices when there's nobody talking, or it may be manifest in the individual having a belief that is clearly false and that will lead to some uh, uh, d uh, disturbed functioning or disturbed behaviour. I don't think any professional could have imagined no. that he'd end up uh, killing his victims and then trying to uh, eat their body parts. No, I'd agree. I, I think uh, it had to be recognised before this that there was a potential that he may commit serious violence and that he may commit a homicide, but I don't think this element of the offence could ever have been anticipated. You've come across inmates who had had gone in during these psychotic episodes. I mean, it's just, how do you make sense of them? I think it's very difficult to make sense of them. It's not, um, you know, e particularly for, for lay people that have had no experience um, working with people with, with, who do have uh, psychotic episodes, it's, it's, um, it's very difficult to understand and quite often the person gets frustrated because they know exactly what they mean, but everyone around them doesn't. At the time of the crime, he kind of is quite transparent and delusional and talks about owning the body. But afterwards, he does try and normalise it. Yes, he tries and gives an explanation as to why he's done it. So he's, he's saying that cannibal, cannibalism has been around for centuries, um, as if it's, you know, everybody does it. He, that he had butter with his brains. Again, like everybody, like it's perfectly normal. So it's almost like he's justifying his acts. Thankfully, he was caught. He didn't seem to have any regard in the moment for the consequences. 
Uh, no, I, I, I don't think he, he would have been considering the consequences. I think he was driven by his urges, his disturbed urges and impulses at the time and gave no concern to anything else. Once arrested, Brian is taken to London's Belmarsh Prison, a Category A high security facility. Up until that moment, he's been calm, but suddenly his mood changes. He then threatened to eat the noses and ears of all the prison officers. And therefore, whenever they had to access him in his cell, they had to use riot gear, the full frontal riot shield, to get in there. Within days, he's transferred from Belmarsh Prison to Broadmoor, Britain's leading maximum security hospital. They very, very quickly wanted to move him because um, it, it was demanding resources. Uh, he, he was felt dangerous. He was threatening. Uh, they were concerned about self-harming. Broadmoor is not a prison, but a secure hospital. Patients often have more freedom than a prisoner would. In Brian's case, this leads to yet another tragedy. Within weeks of arriving at Broadmoor, a maximum security hospital, Brian is placed in a medium secure area with horrendous consequences. In the medium secure area, prisoners are allowed to socialize. One of Brian's fellow inmates is Richard Loudwell, a 59-year-old awaiting trial for the sexual assault and murder of an 82-year-old woman. What actually happened was that Richard had complained of bullying from Peter Bryan and others, calling him a nonce, uh, calling him a lowlife. Uh, there were eight, nine, ten Broadmoor inmates in the dining room. There was one evening in the, in the dining area. He sat upon a fellow inmate called Richard Loudwell, and he tried to strangle him with a cord from his trousers and then um, battered his head on the floor when Brian was restrained he said quite openly if you hadn't stopped me I would have eaten him as well given hindsight it's almost unbelievable that Brian was allowed to mix freely without constant supervision what went so badly wrong well that's partly because they considered him to be trustworthy to take his own medication and therefore he ought to be safe. Uh, and the complement of nine uh, nursing staff was considered sufficient, but at the, the time it happened, there were no nursing staff in the dining room. They could only hear the commotion from outside. So with his track record of, of killing, um, the fact that these experts at Broadmoor considered him to be um, safe and trustworthy to self-medicate is um, does make a belief. So what's what went wrong in Broadmoor that allowed um, Mr. Loudwell to be murdered? Um, so, so I think the assessment prior to him coming in, which was uh, questionable, um, whether there was sufficient attention given to understanding the risks that he may present once he arrived in Broadmoor. So he was rushed through the stages in Broadmoor and then allowed free association and unsupervised engagement with another patient. Yes, at, at a time when there may not have been a complete understanding of what had led to him to reoffend again. He would have had, like, reports from the prison saying how violent he'd been, that he was threatening staff, that staff didn't feel safe. That would all have been written up and sent with him to Broadmoor. Whether they chose to read those documents and take any notice, who knows? I mean, simply beggars believe that this is now the third m murder, and, of course, this is a murder within a high-secure unit. Absolutely, and completely um, predict predictable um, when he was arrested for the murder of Mr. Cherry. Uh, Peter Bryan said that to the police at that time, um, I will kill again. And what did he say uh, when he was found with Mr. Loudwell's body? He said, if you hadn't have come in, I would have eaten him too. So it's quite clear there's a continued psychotic episode here. That tells you somebody failed along the way here. Uh, yeah, so, so the investigation has, has raised some very serious concerns about how he was managed at various stages through the pathway.
In 1993, Peter Bryan kills an innocent young woman, Nisha Sheth. After 11 years of detention, he's allowed back into the community. Before long, he murders Brian Cherry, and this time, he eats his victim. Peter Bryan is sent to Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital, where within days, he kills a fellow inmate. A catalogue of failures by the justice system has created a monster. Brian is now awaiting trial for two murders. At this point, he must be examined by psychiatrists from both the defence and prosecution to assess his state of mind at the time of the killings. He was assessed by Dr Martin Locke, psychiatrist. During it, apparently Peter Bryan said to Dr Locke, you're very intelligent, you have a lot of power. He also said that he intended to um, get power from their souls of all these victims, and that he intended to um, be notorious as a serial killer and murder eight people. And it's obvious that Dr. Locke felt very uncomfortable during that interview and that presence. Unusually, both the prosecution and defense employed two psychiatrists to examine Brian. Peter Bryan was clearly a very, very complex individual with huge psychological difficulties. It may be that each side engaged two psychiatrists because they were looking at issues of insanity. You know, if someone is mentally ill in a significant way and they commit manslaughter, then the obvious sentence is a hospital order. It, the question of whether a hospital order or a prison sentence is imposed will depend on whether the judge feels that the individual requires psych psychiatric treatment. On March 15, 2005, Brian appears at the Old Bailey. Because Brian cooked and ate the brains of his second victim, Brian Cherry, the press dub him the cannibal murderer. Media from across the globe flock to his trial. I've never known such interest from media organisations from home and abroad. Uh, you know, there was some TV crews or media outlets coming to the Old Bailey from Germany and from France and from uh, America. Unquestionably, part of that was a morbid fascination in seeing what does a human cannibal in the 21st century look like. When Brian arrives in court, he's no disappointment. Peter Brian was a big barrel-chested man. He was one of those you would think uh, he would have no difficulty uh, in killing or even dismembering. Uh, he, he really did. He, he, he looked brutish. This time, the authorities are taking no chances. Brian is heavily sedated. Peter Brian was led into court between five of Broadmoor's earliest uh, male nurses, uh, basically security staff. Uh, it was clear that uh, they had administered the old liquid kosh to him. His eyes were fixed in size of saucers, but without any link between it seen between his brain and what he was seeing. And when he sat down, he sat there for several hours, uh, just staring ahead. He really didn't seem to know what was going on. Psychiatrists for both the prosecution and defence agree that Brian was mentally ill at the time of the killings. One of the psychiatrists said that this was the most dangerous man this experienced psychiatrist had ever interviewed. The judge finds Brian guilty on two charges of manslaughter under the Mental Health Act. If a person is convicted of manslaughter, and found to have been very seriously mentally ill at the time of the killing, it's open to the court to impose um, a hospital order without limit of time. Um, I mean, that is the equivalent of a, a life sentence in prison, but it's a hospital order whereby that individual, in effect, serves their sentence in a secure hospital. The Lord Chief Justice said that it's very unlikely that Peter Bryan will see the light of day, will ever be released. He is just too dangerous. Bryan is taken from the court to be returned to Broadmoor Secure Hospital indefinitely.
Peter Bryan is a triple convicted murderer with a cannibalistic fetish for cooking and eating the flesh of his victims. Despite years of psychiatric assessments and evaluations, he managed to disguise those tendencies from those who should have known better. Brian is unwell and will live out the rest of his days in a secure psychiatric hospital, somewhere he should never have left after his first murder. There will always be prisoners that are too dangerous for prison. Not only are they too dangerous, they're too dangerous to themselves, they're too dangerous to prison staff, they're too dangerous to other prisoners. Um, and, and that's why we have, we, we have places like Broadmoor and Rampton, because, you know, the, these are, are, in my opinion, completely untreatable individuals. In the course of Brian's hearing, the prosecutor drew attention to multiple failings across the justice and mental health care system. The prosecutor made it clear that there had been lamentable failings by mental health workers and specialists involved in this case, and that the public had failed to be protected from this man. Tragically, failures in the justice system have serious ramifications for anyone with mental health problems. The people who are worst affected are the not ordinary patients, the thousands of people with a mental illness diagnosis and their families, all of whom are tarnished by these headlines of these particularly horrific cases. And we would almost beg that the only way that we reduce stigma in mental illness is when we stop having this litany of failures. Three people have been murdered at the hands of Peter Bryan. Shockingly, two were killed while Bryan was under the care and supervision of the mental health services. How do you reflect upon these three terrible murders and, of course, Mr. Bryan? And how, I mean, how do you reflect upon this terrible case? My first reflection is that there has been loss of life. Um, uh, I, I would also consider that this illustrates the need for there to be expert forensic practice. So there needs to be a consideration of not just whether someone is obviously mentally unwell, but it's to, be, it's to look at this, the um, uh, less obvious signs and to take those less obvious signs very seriously and to consider whether the approach that is being adopted is the right approach. For me, the judge's summing up at the end kind of said it all. If I would just, just read you what the judge said, he said that um, Mr. Bryan was calm and cooperative while harboring bizarre, psychotic, um, beliefs and for me that that hits the nail right on the head right the way through the the tragic loss of the the three victims um, I think that he was it was at so many stages we 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 and I say the the general we had the opportunity to a help mr. Brian um, but more importantly to help the victims of, of this tragic um, event. So what would his conditions be in Broadmoor like today? It's possible to know how well he's progressed, but he may move within the hierarchy of wards within Broadmoor um, to a, a low dependency ward if his mental health has improved and if the behaviours that have been of concern in the past have settled down. Um, but it is unlikely that he would move from that institution. How unusual is it for uh, patients within the mental health institutions in the high school units yes. to kill another patient. It, it's a, a, extremely rare, extremely rare. And, uh, you know, as a prison governor, I mean, the murder rate within prison is higher than the murder rate outside, but again, it's still pretty rare. You say that the rate is higher, but actually, you have 1,200 men that are in a place that they don't want to be. You know, you are going to have violence. Um, but thankfully, the, the instances of murder are very rare. And I suppose that's why the uh, murder of uh, Mr. Loudwell in a high security unit in Broadmoor, in these circumstances, is perhaps the most devastating and distressing of all. He, uh, yes, and bearing in mind that uh, this was an individual who had killed before, and that was known to the uh, team at Broadmoor. In 2009, three comprehensive National Health Service reports assessed the care and treatment of Peter Bryan. 
a large number of failures in the system were identified and many recommendations made. Three people brutally murdered. If Brian had been diagnosed and treated earlier, maybe two lives could have been saved. Let's hope the justice system has learned from these tragic events.